that. Steve Baker, professor of psychology at Harvard. Amazing. So you tried the MetaQuest, right? I did, after previously having tried the Apple Vision Pro. I have a uh, both a professional interest as someone uh, who studies cognition, including visual cognition, especially three-dimensional visual cognition, and also as a, an amateur stereo photographer. I like taking pictures either with a special camera or moving a camera over a few inches, getting two views, one from the left eye's vantage point, one from the right eye's vantage point. When they are then presented to uh, each eye of the viewer, it, the image pops out in depth in a way that it doesn't in a monocular display. So I've long been interested in stereo vision, and this is in, in some ways the next step. Uh, with, with, when a virtual reality headset gives you that even a um, uh, being in a movie theater or looking at a display close up doesn't give you three things. One of them is <clears throat> stereo vision, that extra sense of depth from the disparity between the views delivered to the two eyes. <clears throat> the second is stimulate visual stimulation out into the periphery of the visual field, which is very important because if even though you can barely make out any detail in the periphery. You can barely make out any detail uh, as soon as you're a few degrees up away from the fovea. Just hold up your hand uh, a few inches from the line of sight. You can't even count your fingers. So you're getting a very coarse, blobby view of the world outside the fovea. However, uh, when there is motion, either the world moving or you moving, they, there's an awful lot of contour uh, giving you an awful lot of information about the motion. And Peripheral vision is an enormously important cue to spatial orientation, to balance. <clears throat> you could try this for yourself by uh, trying, to, trying to stand on one leg with your eyes closed. Surprisingly difficult, even though we do have these special organs, one on each side of the skull, the vestibular system, with the semicircular canals, which are designed by evolution to <clears throat> give the brain information about acceleration in three dimensions and rotation in three dimensions. Still, with, even with the uh, inner ear, the vestibular system, the uh, visual system gives a huge amount of information about the body's orientation in space. When my grandmother uh, lost her uh, peripheral vision from the glaucoma, and I bought her a subscription to a large print a newspaper, she said, thanks, but you know, it doesn't really help me in uh, walking down the hallway because when I don't have the peripheral vision, uh, I feel very unsteady. And then you can try it again for yourself by just closing your eyes and standing on one leg. But the other thing that a headset gives you is that when you move, the um, world uh, stays still, uh, and um, but parts of your body move with you because of the the uh, computer actually updates the view of the world that you get depending on your head position. Then uh, it's uh, it'll be very different than if you say had a fixed photograph of the world kind of hanging in front of your face that, that moved as you moved your head. This stays put as you move your head the way the world does. So it does give you a pretty vivid view of reality. And uh, what I found uh, uh, most worth, worthwhile is that I don't play video games. There's a huge gaming opportunities. And, and I did try of, uh, a uh, one of the most popular video games where you have a lightsaber and you slice cubes that are flying at you. It's a bit like Fruit Ninja. Uh, it's, uh, anyway, you, uh, you just slice these flying cubes that come in, in, in time with uh, your favorite music. And you know, that was fun for a few seconds, but, but I got bored. But what, what was a unique experience was simulating things that I probably wouldn't do in real life, like um, uh, jumping to a uh, canyon in Moab National Park uh, with, uh, with a parachute or a paraglider or um, uh, mm -hmm. be killed by a guy in a, uh, a wing suit. Um, and uh, there, because you really get a yawning sensation of depth and a sensation of motion from the periphery, peripheral vision, um, I can't say it feels like it would to um, paraglide over the you know, Grand Canyon, because I've never done it, <laughs> but, uh, but it's not like looking at a movie. It is, uh, there is a buzz there in that yawning sensation in your, uh, in your stomach. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the content for the MetaQuest is pretty low res, especially what you get off uh, YouTube. Uh, the Apple product is 10 times as expensive. Uh, you do get more content, more resolution, but you don't get, and this is another thing that interests me as a psychologist, is that 
uh, when you're wearing a <clears throat> meta crest, um, you're wearing these uh, this opaque mask. I mean, no one sees the top half of your face. When you wear the Apple product, they engineered a kind of deep fake of your eyes in a screen, which itself is a 3D screen, so that someone looking at you gets a simulacrum of your eyes. So you get some approximation of eye contact and facial expression. Now, everything that I've described, I'm playing video games and, and then getting vicarious sensations of extreme sports, is not how these were marketed. And it wasn't the original uh, vision, if you'll, if you'll pardon the expression of the creators. The fact that uh, that Facebook renamed themselves Meta after the so-called Metaverse indicated that they hoped this would be the next step in human um, experience, that maybe we would spend a large part of our time wearing these gizmos and um, therefore interacting with a mixed uh, or augmented reality. That is, you have your, your desk, you have your, uh, your surroundings. And there is a lot of pass-through so that you you can actually walk around pretty well without bumping into anything because you get a video image of the world from the, uh, the cameras. And the idea that would be augmented, that there'd be uh, virtual objects on the surfaces and um, icons that you could press and information readouts. Um, now, the reason, I think it's pretty much a consensus that we uh, the, the metaverse did not uh, catch on uh, we're living in a metaverse, and we probably won't. The idea of you know a, a couple, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, sitting on a couch, each wearing their headset and interacting with each other through the cameras and the deep fakes image of each other's face while they're say watching a movie, not not so likely. Uh, for for reasons that um, I, I'm <clears throat> I've explored in my my uh, forthcoming book when everyone knows that everyone knows. Uh, common knowledge and the mysteries of money, power, and everyday life. The book is about a phenomenon um, it discovered by logicians called uh, common knowledge. When I know something, you know it. I know that you know it. You know that I know it. You know that I know that you know it. Ad infinitum, which is necessary for coordination, for agreeing to rendezvous, for agreeing on a tech standard, for agreeing to use paper currency, driving on the right. But also to agree on a social relationship. Are we friends? Are we lovers? Are we boss and subordinate, supervisor and supervisee, transactional partners? Um, that's ratified by common knowledge, by two people knowing something and knowing that the other knows that they know that the other knows it. And one of the easiest ways of generating common knowledge is not so much by thinking, I know that she knows the pillow, she knows the higher, she knows because your head can kind of spin with two levels of, of uh, embedded understanding, let alone an infinite number, but you can generate common knowledge at a stroke with eye contact. When I look into your eyes, I'm looking at the part of you that's looking at the part of me that's looking at the part of you, um, and that instantly generates this infinite set of um, recursive knowledge states uh, in, in, uh, in an instant, and that's why eye contact is so powerful not just in humans, but in, in many other species, but especially in humans, where we actually evolved these uh, white scleras, that is the white surround around our iris and pupil, um, and our almond-shaped uh, oblong eyes, which allow other people to see uh, the direction of our gaze. Um, very powerful cue because it's a way of uh, quickly generating common knowledge, uh, not just joint attention, that is, am I looking at the Thing the other person is looking at while he can see me looking at it, therefore generating a uh, very powerful bond. But also when you look into someone's eyes, um, you are establishing that, that whatever you are both now thinking about is no longer um, outside common knowledge. There's no more denying it. There's no more elephants in the room or ostriches with your head in the sand or elm or emperor's new clothes. As in the expression, can you look me in the eye and say that? Uh, Eye contact is a, uh, especially if it's sustained, it can be a threat signal, as in the the, the barroom taunt, you looking at me. Um, it can be a sexual signal. My our late colleague, uh, Irv DeVore, taught a course in behavioral biology here at Harvard for many years, he used to say that if any two people look into each other's eyes for more than six seconds, either uh, one of them is going to kill the other or they're going to have sex. 
Um, so it's a powerful signal of, of what's, in, what's in the air, rendering it common knowledge. And that's what you don't get when you're wearing a visor. Even when you're wearing a visor with a deep fake of your eyes, uh, you, you don't get that, that sense. And so all of the cues of either uh, establishing common knowledge by on eye uh, contact, usually fleeting, uh, not so you don't break the six second rule, um, or uh, joint attention to people looking at the same thing in their immediate surroundings, uh, that is inherently isolating. And that's not even counting all of the facial expressions, the quizzical brow, the uh, the crinkled um, uh, expression of a, of a, uh, a smile, uh, the raised eyebrows, all of the other uh, paralinguistic cues that uh, augment the linguistic channel. So you don't get that when you're wearing a visor. And so even if it's cool to uh, jump uh, uh, as if you're wearing a parachute uh, or, or you know, you're a test pilot pretending you're, you're Tom Cruise in that Top Gun, you know, which, which, which is fun for a little while, but um, it can't make up in, in a social setting for the lack of eye contact and facial expressions. What about this idea of the Proteus effect, which is the phenomenon that, you know, people's behavior changes to sort of align with the character that they're playing at the time they're playing it. And, and how does that relate to if you're wearing VR and the opportunities for embodying, you know, an avatar and any feedback loop in, in wanting to continue to embody that avatar? Yeah, there is, there is an effect, and we've seen it in, in uh, other versions of externalizing your body. We do know that bodies make a difference, that uh, people who, men with lower voices, uh, who are uh, taller, are on average more uh, dominant, that uh, <clears throat> women who are better looking um, are become more entitled because they've grown up in, in a world that um, kisses up to them. Um, and, and people obviously enhance their bodies by physical means, such as makeup and uh, heels and um, shoulder pads and other ways of making them look bigger. There's, there's some evidence that people who drive big um, hulking cars and SUVs um, are, are more aggressive uh, on the road. And, and there is that feeling of power. It might even explain why people buy these um, hulking Mack trucks to, to go to the, the, the mall, even in parts of the country with no snow and where they never um, splash through rivers, like on the commercials, but you feel bigger and stronger when you're inside of a, a, a huge uh, uh, SUV. Um, it's also possible that if your avatar has certain characteristics, physical characteristics that you would like, then your personality uh, is uh, adjusted to match. It's a primitive response coming, going back to when, when uh, people's uh, social status really did depend on how um, strong and um, formidable they were. And uh, it's possible in a digital avatar, at least while you're, for as long as you're immersed in that world, um, would would convey that uh, sense of, of uh, self-worth. It also could be a form of um, mutual understanding between people of different races, people of different sexes. What would it be like? I, I sometimes try to imagine as a form of empathy what would it be like if I was in a uh, incarnated in a female body? Can I, you know, look down and I saw, you know, you know, well, with female body parts, uh, you know, where I react differently, would I expect other people to react differently to me? Um, it's a, an imaginative exercise that uh, is probably valuable just in establishing empathy between sexes, between ethnic groups, between ages, between uh, people with different body types, uh, but it could be made more real potentially with um, uh, augmented reality.